Practice in theory, rolling. Yes, rolling, rolling, rolling. That is what I am here to talk about today. Um, yes, my name is Richard Brown. Um, in fact, I have an entire slide about who I am, but I hope most of you know who I am these days. You know, I've been in OpenSUSE since it began. I'm a real passionate advocate for rolling releases. I build two of them in the future technology team at SUSE. And I'm here to talk to you really today about, well, my opinions on this topic. This is a very opinionated presentation. I don't normally put disclaimers in front of in my in my talks. I hold really strong opinions on this topic. I might offend some of you. I apologize. These are my views, not the views of uh, my employer or like any project or group I've ever been affiliated with. And it's perfectly fine if you disagree with me, you know, even if I'm rather forthright with my views in this session. Um, yeah, and you know we can talk about that afterwards. I, I we've got the uh, break at the end, which is great because I've got an awful lot of slides here. So I'm hopefully not going to eat too much into the breaks, and then we can keep on talking afterwards. Anyway, um, at at to start at the very beginning, uh, one of the the things I've increasingly realised is upstream projects change quickly. You know, even conservative upstream projects change very quickly. You know, the kernel every three months, Kubernetes every three months, salt stack every six months, you know, nothing is ever staying still. And, you know, our develop the developers we're working with upstream aren't staying still. And our users don't want to stay still either, because they see this shiny new stuff upstream, and they want it too. It gets even worse when you then think of actually like what do upstream like actually support? You know, the the standard upstream kernel, the stable release, you know, is lucky if it lasts four months. Yeah, you because know, it's basically till the next one comes out. Even the LTS release, you know, is only six or seven years, which is why like Greg Crowharman says these days, you know, even though he's a maintainer of the LTS release, like you know, use the distro one first because if you want something longer supported that's going to be done better than even all of upstream can do kubernetes you know the incredibly popular uh you know new service you know it can just about handle a year of updates like you know it was a year of support after a release you know and that's only in the latest release that i only put in tumbleweed a couple of weeks ago before that it was nine months um, and yeah, salt stack. Yes, it's one and a half years, which is kind of the longest I could really find. Like generally, like some things will support themselves for like two or three versions. So when they're being released every six months, one and a half years kind of comes around. But even in the case of salt stack, you know they're frozen after six months, and like Ceph is like the longest upstream support thing I could really find that you know we're using heavily in in any of the sort of SUSE ecosystem. And you know that's two years, which is still way shorter than even the shortest open SUSE release, besides the rolling ones, of course. As a project as well, we have a whole bunch more upstreams too. So not only are all these upstreams moving quickly and quicker, you know, we, we aren't just doing one regular release these days. We're doing Leap and Jump. Hopefully it'll just be one of them soon. We're doing Tumbleweed. We're doing Uni. We're doing MicroRest. We're doing Cubic. We're doing like 20, 30 other things I didn't bother mentioning on this slide. Because, you know, all of these projects in OpenSUSE have a whole bunch of upstreams that they're working with themselves too. And if you look at like Cubic as an example, you know, the, the whole kind of cloud native container ecosystem, the cloud native computing foundation is kind enough to put all of that together in, in one fancy graph. And oh my God, it's horrific. You know, this is, these are the projects which as, as the cubic maintainer, I have to worry about, you know, integrating with, co-working co with. And every box on that graph that isn't bright white is, or well, every box on the graph that is gray, is a closed source project too. So it's not something that is like just trivial for me to, you know, throw into OBS and build it myself and test it myself. You know, the um, interoperability is, you know, a case of, of not just working Oh, a minute, I've just lost the slides. Can everybody else still see them? Yeah, oh. Yeah, fine. For some reason, the slides have disappeared for me, but as long as everyone else can see them, cool. Um, then, yeah, 
you know, it's it's crazy, it's complicated, and to, you know, in order to inter interoperate with this, you know, we have to move to keep working with it, especially when like the closed source stuff. You know, we have no way of influencing it. You know, it's an upstream, which we have to work with, but we can't see their code, we can't send pull requests, we can't backport anything, and you know, we're just sort of slaves to their moving. And this is the world we live in. Like we're more and more, you know, things have to work even outside of our open source bubble. I mean, you're seeing this on the factory mailing list right now with discussions with NVIDIA. Um, yeah. And yeah, even the projects we've had for a while, you know, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, the kernel is not shrinking anytime soon. And, you know, as this article pointed out, you know, the kernel isn't getting any smaller, but the number of contributors we have to it are which starts worrying me, you know, do we have enough? Are we, are we, are we sustainable? Are we really it, doing things the way we are right now? Is this really going to last us for the next 10, 15 years? Especially when you look also at the other projects, like again, Kubernetes, you know, that's growing both in terms of files and lines of code. And yeah, at their heart, I know regular releases mean well. So, you know, please don't get too offended about all the nasty stuff I'm about to say. You know, because, you know, at the heart, we all try to solve the same problem. You know, you've got thousands of moving parts from thousands of different upstreams. And at the end of the day, as a distribution developer, we want to find some way of putting this in the hands of people. So in a way, they can actually use the darn thing. Um, and, you know, everybody is nervous of change. Developers, are, you know, the people building the distribution, as developers, we're nervous about changing it. And users don't want to, you know, have their systems break, have their systems change. And, you know, you can't break anything if you don't change it, um, which is, yeah, weird but true. Oh, wonderful. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, so change is dangerous. You can't break anything if you don't change it. Um, but even regular releases need a heck of a lot of change. And so, you know, most of these regular distributions, you know, we've we've all kind of asked ourselves, what's the best way of avoiding that? And, you know, oh, we'll just make the smallest amount of changes as possible because, you know, minimum changes are safer, right? Well, no, because what we end up doing is, you know, taking some of that stuff from, from upstream and, you know, at a certain point, and then we freeze it. Um, and, at, and at the point when it was released, it was, you know, designed and tested by upstream with, with the whole ecosystem of dependencies that it needed at that time. And then we freeze that one thing. And then we decide, okay, we're not going to touch this for four or five years or six or seven or 15 if it's silly. Um, but then other stuff still needs to change, you know, security updates still need to happen. And then, but we don't want to change, make a too big a change to that package. So we backport and we just make minor little backports on top of that one thing. But that minor backport, you know, wasn't tested with that entire ecosystem of other stuff that, that made the distribution up. So we end up creating sort of this, this lovely sort of Frankenstein's monster of a distribution where we have to be certain ourselves that everything we have put together is built properly, is working properly. And, you know, it was never designed to be done in that way. You know, it's not safer in, in the pure sense, because it's not really engineered to, to be done that way. We're just kind of hacking around the fact that we've decided to go slower. And so, you know, inherently regular distributions are Frankenstein distributions. And, and that, that really terrifies me. Um, and also, fundamentally, it doesn't even work. You can see this by looking at Sleep 15, you know, which is, you know, it's an enterprise distribution. It's one of the most conservative distributions you can get. It's going to be supported for 13 years since its release. You know, Sleep 15 has been out now for three years. You know, in those three years, they've changed 13,000 packages. <laughs> and, and not just like minor little backports either. That actually includes like over 2,700 actual package version changes in service packs. And the entire code base is less than three and a half thousand packages. So, I mean, those numbers don't think like they've replaced the entire code base four times. Like a lot of the changes have happened in very specific areas. But that's a, a huge amount of change, which which just kind of proves that this this mentality of, you know, oh, a stable distribution can be done isn't actually true. And therefore, what we end up doing is actually hacking around it and pretending to ourselves and pretending to our users that, you know, we're stable 
when in fact we're just rolling, just kind of rolling badly and lying to ourselves. Um, and this isn't including like the 10,000 packages that are in package up. Like this is just the sleep pure pure code base so you know if you look at something like jump or leap you know those numbers are even bigger there's even more change that needs to happen there and i i was looking when i was do, putting together these slides i also wanted to kind of think a little bit about the the psychology and and the the um the appeal beyond our little bubble of as developers and as, as open as open source contributors the bubble we have right now in open source because you know i think insights SUSE and OpenSUSE, you know, we typically you know, lean towards the conservative side of things. Um, so, you know, on this graph, it would be just, um, this is a kind of uh, model of uh, market adoption and which kind of people adopt new products at what kind of pace and, and when in, in a life cycle of a product. You know, and typically speaking, you know, uh, you know, we, we probably lean to the second half of that bell curve. You know, we, we have lots of people who are conservative and you know, are happy being part of the late majority or the laggards to a technology. They're not necessarily that keen to be first. And, and that's fine if you're one of those. Like, a, But, you know, fundamentally, as an open source project, when you start looking into the sort of typical traits of those people, those aren't the people who are that enthusiastic about technology. They are unlikely to be heavily engaged with that technology. They're unlikely to contribute back to that technology. They're also unlikely to have lots of spare money to invest into that technology or to, or, yeah, to contribute back financially. And so when I think of like, what does OpenSUSE need to be, you know, as you know, as we keep on going, as we keep on moving forward, um, you know, I, I realize, you know, we need to start appealing more to that left-hand side of that bell curve to the getting hold of sort of far earlier adopters, far earlier innovators, get them dragged into the project, move, yeah, move them into the project, encourage them to be part of it, encourage them to contribute back. They're going to be more likely to contribute back um, and, you know, potentially encourage them to invest and support and donate and all that other good stuff too. And yeah, so ultimately, you know, slow regular releases are not a more sustainable way of distributing software. You know, every upstream is getting bigger. We're getting more upstreams. Every time we freeze or diverge from that upstream, that's more work for us. And, and we're not getting that much bigger. We're not getting a huge pile of contributors. We're not getting more spare time to work on this stuff. Um, so, you know, we're just risking burning ourselves out every time we to do anything in a regular release as these regular releases get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and ultimately, like first principles of open source, like the whole premise of open source is, you know, we're meant to be doing all of this stuff bigger as a community, you know, like Linus's law states, you know, given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And yet every single regular release like throws almost all of those eyes away. So you're left with a tiny stub of a small subset of contributors who are just working on your regular release and just working on the specific packages in those regular release. And so the whole premise of this open source movement is, is you know, left to not actually benefit us. You know, all bugs are suddenly deep because we've packaged a different version from everybody else and we're using it against libraries that are different from everybody else. And therefore we're on our own when the whole point of this is meant to be we're working with others, right? And whenever I talk about this stuff, the first thing that everyone throws back in my face is like, okay, fine, like, we get you, Richard, we know where you're coming. So why not like have a distribution, which is like, partially slow or partially rolling, because I want to have something stable, but I want to have some things moving. Um, and I, I have to point out this, this example, because you know, this is where Tumbleweed started back in 2010, when Greg Crohoman started it, that's exactly what Greg was doing building a regular base on top of OpenSUSE releases. And actually, since I first talked about this, I even heard there was like even earlier experiments internally at SUSE where they tried it too. And it always ended up in the same result. Like, you know, wh whatever you did with that rolling base, you know, whenever you'd, you'd end up having to overwrite and supersede packages from that stable part. Um, and then you'd have to have some way of like rebasing it or resetting it to zero every release. And the impact on users and the impact on engineering was an absolute nightmare. You know, just building it became an absolute pain because as, as the chasm grew between the stable bit and the rolling bit, you constantly had new breakages that no one again had tested for. Like even worse than the, the stable version because you had more change because you, yeah. So, you know, even worse than keeping things stable and backporting everything, you had sort of that element plus the fact you were trying to move faster. 
And then when you did try and fix those issues by like ad hoc tinkering or superseding inside the stable base, then it stopped the stable base being stable. Um, and then, yeah, resetting everything to zero was brutally disruptive to users because no matter how much we tried, we always ended up with like the regular, the rolling base going in, the rolling part going in one direction, the stable base going in another, and then like everything got mashed together. And yeah, users suddenly found they had a completely different system from what they were expecting every eight months. Parallel to this, though, we were trying to find ways of making tumbleweed more stable. Uh, sorry, factory more stable. And, you know, factory in the in the build service, like we've always built it, building everything together, one code base, rebuilding the entire dependency tree as stuff's added. And with, yeah, at the time, we were then also adding OpenQA and making OpenQA a key part of the release system. So, you know, testing it the way users want to use it, leveraging OpenQA, LDP, and all this other stuff, and only shipping when it's all green or green enough. And then, you know, well, then, you know, that process has worked we've proven it to, to be a very sustainable and reliable way of doing things you know tumbleweed is six this tumbleweed is now six years old it's still sustainable it still works for its for its target audience more about that later the other thing that people throw at me whenever i talk about this stuff is okay fine you know you could have a rolling base system and then just you know containers will fix everything anyway richard so why are you even worrying about this operating system stuff anymore um and so yeah started with with app image which, you know, is kind of a fun example because it's a desktop example. So you always get like graphics and, you know, people are more likely in this group to be hands on with it. And, you know, it promises to be a portable format where, you know, your Linux app can run anywhere and there's plenty of upstreams using it. Yes, I know there was a LibreOffice talk about app image here today. There's one problem, like promise to run everywhere apart from it doesn't run everywhere and they even document that it doesn't run everywhere because you have to cram all the system dependencies for every distribution you possibly could want to run it on into the app image so if you don't want to make an app image that is a couple of terabytes in size I'm exaggerating slightly for effect but you get the idea you know then it's you know, it's going to be a subset of distributions it works on there's going to be a subset of distributions it doesn't work on and this isn't just me, you know, bashing on app image because I really don't like it. You know, this is true with, with all containers everywhere. Um, you know, even my beloved baby Cubic, where I'm running Kubernetes, you know, you have a situation there, which I won't go into detail too much because I could probably talk about that for half an hour on its own. But, you know, the containers running on a host still have dependencies from a host. You know, they still have to have the right container runtime. They still have to have the right kubelet in this case. So when you need to upgrade your containers, there's times where you need to make sure the containers get updated first before the software on the host operating system does, otherwise they stop talking to each other. And there's sometimes the inverse too, where you have to make sure the base system is updated before the, contain the, before the containers are, you know, but Zipper doesn't know about that. No package manager knows about that. So that becomes, you know, a fun, complicated challenge. So basically at its heart, this idea that like containers are like totally distribution neutral and you can run any container on any machine and it's all wonderfully isolated is a myth. You know, it's, there are some cases where it's true, but you still, if you're doing containers properly, you still need to at least think about it the same way you think about a traditional distribution. You know, build everything properly, test everything properly, release it all aligned together. And doing that with traditional RPMs is what we've been doing in Cubic and we found it, it just works really, really smoothly. Um, part of that, like you say, is because containers can be like really unfair and like require stuff from the host, which might not exist on your system if you're not careful. So yeah, that needs to be taken into account. If you take it into account, you actually end up with a weird situation where because containers do try and isolate themselves from the host and because you're testing everything and because you're building it all consistently, you kind of know where those fracture points are going to be. Things like when there's a new glibc library popped in and therefore, you know, all your containers are building differently than they used to. Um, so once you're aware of those kind of fracture points, or like in the case of Kubic, actually, like Kubernetes versions do this every time. Once you know where those risks are, you can actually be more liberal elsewhere. So you can have a situation where you do have the base system moving at a different pace from the containers, but it's only going to work with specific containers and it's only going to work with specific containers at specific times. You can't treat everything equally. Uh, so when it comes to rolling releases, this is this is something that I've been talking about for a while. There is this 
well, what I now consider a, a, a kind of fundamental axiom with, with rolling distributions. If you want to be able to move any part of a complicated system like a distribution, you need to have a process in place where you can change everything. Um, and this is where like OBS helps. This is where OpenQA helps. This is where our release process in Tumbleweed helps. You know, where, you know, the process and the tooling is there now where we can literally have someone strolling off the street tomorrow and want to change the entire distribution. And we say, yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, we can trust, we can try that. If you don't have that, you know, this, this idea is, is going to fall on its face initially. So, you know, being able, you really need to make sure that you are open to the possibility that everything changes, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to change everything all the time, all at once. And there's real benefits from doing doing it this way. You know, the more rolling, you know, the, when you're rolling, the closer you are to upstream, the better it is for everybody. It's easier for distribution builders because we can benefit from what everybody else is doing upstream. We have an easier time talking to those upstreams. We have an easier time contributing back to them. That also means we have an easy time for our users too. You know, our users are going to have more information that is accurate about the current version of stuff that's running. When they need help, there's more people that can help them. And all in all, it reduces a whole bunch of double work, retesting, or like this this never ending death spiral of like backports that require backports that require backports, and then yeah, then people wonder why it takes so long sometimes to release a patch in something like Leap. But change is still scary, and not everybody wants to go at the speed of tumbleweed, you know, or, you know, as fast as everybody else does, and not every upstream is necessarily aligned, even with the stuff they're using themselves. So, like, I really wish that was true. Where like every distribution took care, and every upstream took care, and when they're dependent on something, they like talk to each other and make sure they all kind of release things reasonably aligned. But it doesn't happen, and you know, we don't live in a perfect world. Um, and that gives us, therefore, a little bit of work to, to worry about or to take care. Um, and yeah, I, I think I've already mentioned this, but you know, speed is an element of rolling releases, but it's not necessarily the defining part of it. You know, full speed is not the only speed. Right now, with tumbleweed, we've proven we can go as fast as upstreams. We have proven we can go as fast as contributions. Um, I think rolling releases are the answer at any speed where our users want to be. Um, I don't think regular releases are the right way of doing software in 2020, full stop, the end. Um, and so, you know, if Tumbleweed is too fast for you, fine. You know, then let's look at our, our answers where, you know, we find a better balance that takes everything we know from the process and everything we know from the ability to move quickly and slow it down at a pace, which, you know, doesn't scare too many users away doesn't let us drift too far from upstreams. You know, maybe there is like this lovely Goldilocks point that no one's found yet of like a rolling release that's just fast enough. Um, I, I'm really keen in exploring that idea. Um, and in some ways, I already am kind of exploring that idea. You know, with MicroOS, which I was talking about in my earlier session, you know, we already have a distribution where the the amount of change that happens to microOS is less than the rest of Tumbleweed. So even though it's built on Tumbleweed, um, you know, microOS is a smaller distribution. It's just there to run one thing. In this case, I'm going to say it's just there to run containers. And if it's just running containers, you know, there isn't that much to change. You know, kernel, Podman, it's kind of it. That's all it does. Um, so you don't get quite so many updates. You don't have quite so much risk. The risk gets mitigated by the fact that it's immutable anyway. So, you know, while it's running, it's not going to change. When it reboots, well, you know, when it reboots, you know exactly what services are running on there, just Podman. So it's trivial for open for microOS itself to figure out, is my are my Podman containers still running? And if they're not, then automatically fix itself and roll itself back. So, you know, you can keep the code base running at full speed, but actually ship something that's so much smaller that the fact that the code base is going really, really quickly doesn't really matter because the only part that the user is exposed to is, yeah, this relatively small uh, couple of hundred packages. And, you know, well, if they're tested well, and touch wood, I do a pretty good job of testing them. It always works. It's just as stable as, as Leap or something even more conservative. Um, and in my case, that's why I actually started doing that, wanted to do this presentation. You know, I don't use any regular releases in my distribution now. My next cloud, my emulation station, everything is now, you know, yeah, my Minecraft server, everything is now running on Leap. 
Um, someone just asked a question, automated updates can be dangerous on changes of major versions of a package. Any option to pin a package to a major version would be really helpful. Any ideas, plans about that? Um, well, you can theoretically pin something. I would argue that it's the wrong way to think about it. You know, in the case of microOS, have the update happen and have your health checker run. You know, if health, if health checker says it's running fine, then it's running fine. If health checker says it's not running fine, it's going to roll itself back and pin itself. So manually interacting with the package manager to figure out what version is running where, like that's, that's not something you should be worrying about on the base system. Now that might be something you want to worry about on the service you're running, like on my next cloud. Yeah, sure. I, I pin my next cloud to the stable stream because the, the beta stream is horrifically dangerous, but that's something that you do in containers. That's just deciding which container pools. That's, that's not anything to do with the operating system. That's, you know, that's now user space and with this concept, not, not something I have to worry about as a distribution engineer. You can run whichever version of Nextcloud you want. Um, and that kind of actually leads me nicely to this, I, this epiphany that I had when I gave a version of this talk last week. So unfortunately, I know we're, t we're at half past. I'm going to go on for another like five, 10 minutes, I'm afraid. Sorry. Um, that, you know, is everybody doing everything wrong? Um, you know, we know that RPMs are great for building. You know, we've been doing it for years. OBS is great. All is good. But it can be painful for users. Why do we still make users deal with packages? You know, why, you know, containers are a real thing. People, more and more people know how to use containers. You know, back to that ridiculous graph I showed earlier. You know, there's plenty of projects out there that only do containers. Uh, when you look at that ridiculous graph, you realize there's all these projects that are container first. But there isn't actually a container first operating system out there, like not one that's really thought, what should we look like if we still wanted to be interactive, we still wanted to have users work with it like they work with a, you know, open SUSE or, or other server distribution. Um, but, you know, didn't give help, didn't have RPMs, didn't have packages, you know, didn't have a package manager that you interacted with in the same way. You just use containers and only containers. Um, because, yeah, again, contentious point maybe, but I don't think developers or sysadmins really want to care about packages. You know, they just want either their service that they want to run, or if they're a developer or a DevOps engineer, you know, maybe the languages or the libraries they care about for the thing they want to build against. Um, well, containers are really a really easy way to actually sort of translate all of the stuff we've been doing for the last 20 odd years um, and offer users our software in a new format which is actually better aligned with that way of thinking. You know, just give people the services they want, just give people the languages and libraries they want, and don't have them faffing about with packages and yeah, worrying about all that stuff. So this is a crazy concept. So crazy concepts for me normally end up with a bad name attached to it. And then the bad name has a habit of sticking. Maybe this one will, hopefully not. Um, I'm calling this idea cool. You know, what about if we had a, an operating layer, you know, a container only system that just did nothing but containers, basically something like micro OS, but actually having like a whole ecosystem of containers ready to use that were built together, that were tested together, because, you know, I do accept the fact that the outside wide world of containers isn't necessarily the best way you want to be encouraging people to consume all of that stuff. Some of those containers out there are very broken. Um, yeah, and like just like Brett is saying in the chat right now, you know, containers are currently problematic because they're not curated like system packages are. He's right. This is where this idea comes in. You know, what if we had a curated collection of library of, of uh, containers really handled for what people want to use these days? Like I've called this concept runtimes because I like flat packs. I've copied the idea from them basically. You know, why not have a bunch of runtime containers that contain the language libraries, the tool chain all bundled together? So, you know, you'd have a Python runtime, you'd have a Golang runtime. And then after that, you know, you'd have apps, you know, basic proper service containers that are ready to go with the actual thing that, you know, sysadmins want to run, you know, Apache, MariaDB, whatever, DHCP, etc. You know, running the apps would be a simple, you know, podman pool, you know, some nice, simple, short name running from registry to OpenSUSE.org and, you know, building your own service based on an existing one would be a simple case of like using Builder or, you know, Docker with a Docker file and just, you know, pulling that from that same service. 
same would go for the runtimes. You know, it would, this would be an incredibly easy, simple platform for anybody doing anything containers to just, you know, pull their runtime and they'll get Python 3 and they won't necessarily, they won't need to care about exactly which, you know, unless they want to, then in which case they can change the version number at the end. But they shouldn't need to care about exactly which version of Python are they, are they working on. You know, they should just be able to pull it down, have everything they need in there, have, have, yeah, have the Python command line, have all the libraries ready to go. And then just base their container alongside it so they can, you know, have have their builder from, I don't just put builder pool there, but I meant builder from Golang and build the container alongside it. Job done. Um, this is how users would see it. You know, nice, simple, very container, cloud native friendly. But actually behind the scenes, I think I've got a good idea how we could build this whole thing in OBS like relatively quickly. Um, using OBS for what it's really good for and actually having a whole bunch of sub-projects. So, you know, you'd have a, a master project, I'm calling it cool in this example here, um, have these runtime sub-projects, have sub-projects for things like Python at specific versions, and then have the packages dependent on those also built separately there. So you, you'd be building RPMs very similar to how we do current RPM builds. The difference is you'd have an interesting nesting of sub-projects but everything would still be built together. We're not talking about like freezing these subprojects artificially like we do with with regular releases. You know, so you know, every, every new thing gets into the base system. Everything can rebuild. Get a whole bunch of new containers. Um, you know, should, yeah. So you're still honoring the kind of build together part. Um, the testing together again, same kind of thing. The shipping together again, same kind of thing we're doing with tumbleweed, but. There will be times when things need to diverge. There'll be times when we do want to pin a, a, a Python runtime to something, or there'll be a time when something might break a little bit. And this way, we'd actually be in a position to allow that to happen. You know, we could actually release the you know, the other runtimes that are fine. We could release the base system that are fine, and we can leave the containers there until we get around to fixing it, or until the support lifecycle is down. So, you know, we don't always necessarily need to move everything at warp speed. We could speed things up or slow things down unless, you know, as we need to. Um, and, you know, this might be built in a really complicated way in OBS, but users would just see this in like the examples I gave earlier, a nice, simple layered in registry to open SUSE to where we flatten it all down and keep it simple, which is kind of what we're doing already when you look at the micro OSs and, and other containers that we have in the open SUSE namespace, you know, they're built in a multitude of different ways, and yet they just appear as like OpenSUSE Tumbleweed or OpenSUSE MicroOS or uh, sorry, OpenSUSE BusyBox. Um, so yeah, keeps it simple. We don't want things to be complicated for people to use. Somebody asked what about the desktop, which is really cool because I already put a slide in for that. Um, I already did a talk about the MicroOS desktop. <laughs> um, this is a very, the cool idea is a very server oriented idea. Um, I think for the desktop side of things, the MicroOS desktop is kind of already on track for that. Um, so, and I already, that's what that wants to be the rolling release that I use. So please, my video for the, my last session is already, uh, already on YouTube. You can watch that talk already. Um, or you can go to this talk tomorrow where Davio is actually talking about like how he is actually using the MicroOS desktop as his daily driver. So, you know, you could already argue the desktop side of this equation is already well on the way to being fixed. And this like this cool idea is yeah figuring out how to give a similar kind of curated solution for the server container side of things. Now I've run eight minutes over. There's been a whole bunch of questions in the chat. I will try my best to snipe a few out before I stop. I addressed Brett's thing. I agree with that. Answered Pedro's thing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Axel, yeah, you have to worry about the software that runs on the system, not in the container. That's the point of this. That's, you know, let's use that for all it's worth so we can worry about less stuff. That's part of my goal here as well. You know, not only moving stuff quicker and being more aligned with upstream, but also cutting down on the amount of stuff we have to look after. If upstreams are taking care of stuff well, you know, then there's not, there might be a case of no even need to curate them and put them into cool. Um, but if they're not doing it well, if the curation is needed, then you know, let's do it properly rather than just putting things you know, all over the place. Upstream can never be trusted. Um, yeah, this time Upstream can do a better job than we can. We can't always be trusted either. 
Um, and yeah, that's it. Any other questions for the chat or voice before we call it a day? Because I don't want to take any more of your break. No? Cool. If anybody really likes this idea, please like ping me in, uh, well, IRC or chat or email or factory or whatever um you know you're likely to see this is my hack week project next time susa have a hack week <laughs> um because I, I i think i could even start bootstrapping this stuff alongside tumbleweed um i want to see how far this idea goes but yeah if other people like it too let's go cool yeah pun intended okay thank you everybody bye bye